Hello, everyone. My name is Ole Kagan, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with LA County Library, and I welcome you to Work Ready, all about resumes. Before we get going with today's event, I will do the land acknowledgement, take care of some housekeeping, and tell you a little bit about the Work Ready program. The County of Los Angeles recognizes that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tataviam, Serrano, Kich, and Chumash peoples. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. We acknowledge that settler colonization resulted in land seizure, disease, subjugation, slavery, relocation, broken promises, genocide, and multi-generational trauma. This acknowledgement demonstrates our responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, and reconciliation, and to elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these ancestral lands. We are grateful. We are dedicated to growing and sustaining relationships with Native peoples and local tribal governments, including, in no particular order, the Fernandino Tataviam Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Tongva Indians of California Tribal Council, the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians Keech Nation, San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, the San Fernando Band of Mission Indians. To learn more about the First Peoples of Los Angeles County, please visit the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission website at lanaic.lacounty.gov. And I will post that so that you can have that website. All right, so now let's go ahead and take care of some of our housekeeping stuff. So if you can hear me and see me and see the slide up on the screen, then you're good to go. However, if you're having trouble hearing me or seeing me or seeing the slide on the screen, do let me know in the chat and I will do my best to assist. If you'd like to listen to this presentation on the phone, you can do that by calling 1669-900-6833 and using the access code 879-2263. 5578 and the passcode 123123. You may have noticed that the mics and video is disabled for attendees of this program. That is so everyone can focus on our presenter for the day. We do, however, welcome your questions and comments. We'll have plenty of time for that after the presentation. Questions can go in the Q&A box. That's the one with two speech bubbles. And comments and responses to anything our presenter asks can go in the chat. That's the one with the single speech bubble. All right, and now I'd like to tell you about the Work Ready program. Work Ready started in December of 2020 with the purpose of helping people get a job, improve their work situation, and plan a more sustainable career path. We do that in two ways. One is we lend out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots for six-week loans out of 27 library locations, breaking down one barrier to applying for a job and getting online training. And two is we provide virtual events just like this one on a range of work-related topics from the basics like resumes, cover letters, and interviews to deep dives into various careers and other subjects that can help you succeed at work. And you can check out over 50 of those past classes on the library's YouTube channel. We have a work and career playlist, which you can look at and recommend in case you feel like any of the subjects would help anybody you know. The Work Ready program is made possible due to funds provided by the American Rescue Plan. And we also have a great event for you coming up in a few weeks. That is Work Ready, finding your target audience, whether you're an independent content creator, a small business owner, or work in marketing in a larger organization. We are going to have a panel of successful entrepreneurs sharing with you how they discovered their target audience. I'm going to go ahead and post a description of that program and a registration link for you in the chat, and you can feel free to register for that. And that, of course, is free, just like all of our library programs. And if you'd like to learn more about our library events, whether they're virtual or in person, you can go to our website at lacountylibrary.com. 
www.ncpsoftware.org and click the events link on the top right hand side. If you click that, you get our entire calendar for in-person virtual or in virtual events for all ages, youth, teens, adults, older adults. And if you're interested in just virtual programs like this one, then you can hover over that events link and you'll get a little drop down that says virtual programs. Click on that and you'll just get our Zoom events. And of course, they're all free. All right, it is time to get on to today's program. And to do that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for the day. Stephanie Nwesi is a career coach, founder, content creator, and personal brand expert. She has worked in various top accounting tech com firms, top tech companies, and different banks in New York City and California. Stephanie's passionate about career coaching and public speaking. She has given over 300 workshops and events in 10 countries and has been a guest speaker for companies like Wiley, the AICPA, UBS, LinkedIn, and more. Stephanie has been featured in on Fox News, ABC News, the Den Denver Channel, The Well, the CPA Journal, Josh Talks USA, and more. She has helped over 5,000 students and professionals from all over the world because of her passion to keep involved with the community. She has been, she was chosen as a 2019 Forbes Under 30 Scholar and is now a next gen 30 Under 30 for the Hispanic Executive Magazine, which highlights the most successful Latinos worldwide. Most recently, Stephanie was chosen as a top voice by LinkedIn, which is the highest rank of professionals on LinkedIn. Stephanie's mission is to create an impact in the world one person at a time. And with that, I bring to the stage Stephanie and Wesley. Stephanie, the stage is yours. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I feel like every time I get uh, to hear about myself, uh, it, it's kind of great, but also interesting to, to hear other people um, sharing my bio. And so for everybody that's here, thank you so much for taking the time to come and, and wanting to learn and improve about your resume. I will be sharing my screen and the presentation that I prepared for all of you in a second. But uh, I wanted to first start by saying that I want this to be as interactive as possible. I don't want this to be me talking to you guys for an entire hour. I want to hear from you. I want to understand your struggles with the job search, resume, et cetera. So please, please, please utilize the chat feature, utilize the Q&A feature for your questions. Um, I think we would start by using the chat feature that's at the bottom of the screen. I want to hear from you guys. Um, how are you feeling today? Okay, from one to 10, you can give a five, you can give a nine, you can give a two. I just wanna gather the room. How are the energy levels? Are you feeling excited to go about your job search? Are you feeling defeated? How are you feeling overall when it comes to, to the current situation that you're in? Please use the chat feature and, and I will address and get everybody hopefully to, to attend after, after the session. It's a big challenge, but I'd like to, to get in and gather how everybody's feeling. So I see some comments coming in in the chat. Chad, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think that we're going to to kind of clarify all of those confusions and questions that you guys might have. So as the comments keep coming in, I'll go ahead and start a presentation. There we go. Awesome. So today we're going to be discussing about how you can build your best resume. So we hear a lot of different um thought, facts about resume, what, what are some things that you can do to stand out when it comes to applications? Uh, there, there's different type of applications and applicants, right? So we have people who are entry levels who have uh, one to five years of experience, mid-senior executives, and then you have people who have been in the workforce which are for a long time. And so with that being said, resumes look very different depending on where you are in your career. And so today we want to be able to approach a more general um, description of how your resume should be. And hopefully all of you, no matter what situation you're in, are able to kind of gather those thoughts and being able to um, apply it for your resume. So without further ado, I will show you a little bit about the agenda for today. We'll start with a resume one-on-one -on -one session. So we'll dive deep into what are some of the basics of a resume? What are some current resume tools that you can use to, to update your resume? Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you don't spend five, 10, 100 hours on your resume, right? We want to make sure that you're as efficient as possible so that you can use the time to actually prepare for the interviews and, and, and land the next opportunity. 
And so we're going to also take a look at what is the current state of the job market now and how you can actually go about being successful in the current job market. Then we're gonna go into more in depth into the formatting and structure of a resume. What are some of the best practices that you can use? What does the structure look like, et cetera? I will then teach you how you can actually write bullet points. And so I, I think that a lot of the times we, we, we struggle a lot into how can we really showcase the experience that we have and the accomplishments that, we, that we've had so far. So I'll teach you a formula that's been successful when it comes to writing bullet points. And then last but not least, we'll go into some sample resumes. So I brought four different resumes for you so that we can uh, go through them together and understand what are some of the issues and what are some of the strengths of those resumes. And then you can kind of relate and see whether your resume is in, in those buckets as well. At the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. So as you, I go through the presentation, feel free to start putting your questions in the Q&A chat box and I will make sure and try our best to address them at the end. And so I see some more chats coming in. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, as I said, I'll have a question for you pretty soon. So um, make sure to, 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 to be attentive on the chat because I want to make sure that you guys are with me here. Okay. So let's do a little intro. You guys are probably wondering who, who, who I am. I know that Alex make a great job about introducing me, but um, as he said, I'm a LinkedIn top voice. I create content on LinkedIn about professional development, personal development, career, job search, et cetera. Uh, I have created a community of 400,000 people on social media. And the reason why I created that community, it's because of my background. I'm a first gen Latina, uh, daughter of immigrants who came to the U.S. Um, pursuing different opportunities. And I know that many people struggle with many different things when it comes to landing their, their own careers. And I want to demonstrate that the underdogs can also make it. I want to show that we can change the narrative. I want to show that uh, people that come from non-traditional backgrounds can also make it. I want to show that career pivoters can also make it. So if you're here in the room and for by any chance you're, you, you resonate with any of what I just said, then you are in the right place. Uh, if you're somebody who's looking to change careers, you're in the right place. I'll try my best to address some of your main concerns when it comes to actually showing employers that you have what it takes to get to your next level. And so I have experience working in banking, um, accounting, and, and tech. I've been a career coach for over four, four and a half years now. And um, we've helped tons of people with tons of different things from resume interview and et cetera. And today I want to make sure that you leave this room with tactical and, and actionable steps that you can take um, to, to get to your next level. So let's dive deep into the basics, right? So one question that I want to, to put in and I want to for you guys to please comment in the chat, what are some aspects that you're currently struggling the most with your resume? So think about whether it's a formatting, uh, you're, you're, you're applying, but you're getting rejected. You, you don't know what you're doing wrong. You don't know how to show your metrics. Like what is something that you're struggling with on your resume today that you want answers for? So please use the chat feature. I'll be reading what you guys share on the chat and, and sharing with everybody else. So uh, I'll give you guys 10, 15 seconds to kind of think about what is something you're struggling with with your resume and please share on the chat. And the reason why I'm asking this question now is because I want to make sure that as I address all of the things about resume, I can address some of the things that you guys are struggling with. So please share in the chat. Um, somebody, uh, Blake, thank you so much. Share personalizing to each a specific job more efficiently. Um, let's see, format, font, how to work skills. How to explain a career gap, very important. Addressing work gap, okay. Work gaps are, are showing up a lot, so I'll definitely address that as I go. Perfect, okay. Please keep them coming. Thank you so much. Um. So yeah, as you're thinking about what you're struggling the most, please include that in the chat feature and, and, and I'll make sure to address them. And if you have any questions already, please use the Q&A feature to, to add those questions. So... Here's a little intro about resumes and, and some things that, that we should keep in mind. So what is a resume, right? A resume summarizes your professional background, your skills, your accomplishments, what you've done in the past, um, and it should be just that, right? So that is what a resume is. Uh, a lot of the times there's there's a lot of um, questions about how long should my resume be? What should my resume include? And I will show you a little bit about the structure of what a resume should really include. Why is a resume important? It's important that we keep our resumes up to date because 
this is really our career portfolio, right? Like when, when we're applying for jobs, the first thing they ask us is for a resume. And so if, if our resume is not well edited, well updated, then we'll have a hard time um, trying to like showcase to employers that we're really the best candidate. What are some key elements that a resume should have? Some of the things that resume should have in mind are your contact info, Objective is actually optional, right? So it depends on where you are in your career. If you're somebody who is a career pivoter and you're trying to explain uh, what skills you have and bring to the table, but your experiences don't match the role that you want to go into, then an objective can really, really make a make a difference here. So if you think about it, let, let, let's give an example. You're somebody who is in marketing, but you want to switch into data science, data analytics. If that's the case, maybe your experience might not necessarily fully show that you're somebody who could do the job, but utilizing the space or your real set on your resume for your objective, where you clearly show like in, in a very concise paragraph, what who you are as a professional and what you bring to the table, it is really important. You don't need to really think too much about what, how should I write my objective because I'm going to share with you some resume tools that you can use for free to kind of help you with that. And something else that I'll address here as well is that if you're somebody, as I said, that is a career pivoter, but you have the experience, you have the education, you have everything, but it's in another sector that you might want to think about some of your personal projects and how to start really. I'll talk a little bit more about personal projects when we go into the sample resumes and, and you'll see what do I mean by personal projects. Last but not least, make sure your skills are listed on your resume and then certifications that you're currently taking as well. There's a lot of free programs and, and free certifications online. So if you have the chance, I would recommend for you to do the following. Research what are some of the on-demanded skills for your industry or for your role, and then look for what are some of free certifications that you can take to advance in your career. Somebody or a lot of comments that came in the chat were about career gaps. So one thing that you can do to make sure you show the employer that you are up to date and that 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 you know what's happening, what are some of the current skills and and platforms that are needed for the job is by taking certifications. So you can show that you've actually been doing something to to make sure you are marketable, that you know what's happening now and you know what employers are needing now versus what they needed five, 10 years ago. So again, making sure that you are doing something to show that you, you, you still are covering for, for that gap is it's really important. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we need to look at what's the current job market. The job market that we had 10, 15 years ago, it's not the same job market that we're currently seeing right now. And, and why is this important to, to emphasize? Because the way that you would approach searching for a job now, it's not the same way that you approached three years ago. It's not the same way that you would approach five, 10 years ago. And so we've seen that it's become extremely challenging for job seekers and people to land a job in this current job market. Why? Some of the reasons is because there's more demand than supply. There's not that many jobs out there. There's a lot of people looking for jobs versus the actual supply of jobs. There's a lot of um, what employers are requesting. It's a lot for 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 support at, for candidates, right? And so, how do candidates kind of match to that gap between what employers need versus what they are actually offering? Is also a big challenge that people are facing right now. And so. There's a lot more challenges. There's a lot more things that are happening. People are facing rejections back and forth. Um, they're feeling like they're not, their their applications are not being seen. These are just some things that we've heard from people as looking at reports and 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 and, and statistics and, and how people are saying the job search are going for them. If you want to take a look at how people are going about their job search, I would recommend looking at LinkedIn. Uh, you can take a look at how people are navigating their job search through content and 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 how it's actually it, it and it's good for you to know, right? It's good for you to know what you're facing because that will prepare you and help you prepare better for um for what you're you're about to face. So that was kind of like in, on on the bad news side, and it's really bad news. It's just the facts of what's happening. But now let's talk about how you can actually go about this? How can you stand out? How can you get to the next level? And so one of the things that I always recommend to people is think about what are other people's not, what are people not doing that you can do? So some things you can do to stand out is differentiating yourself as a candidate by showcasing what are some of your unique skills, achievements, 
experiences that you know will be important for the company. What do I mean by this? Let's, let's choose a role. Let's say you are applying for a senior project manager position and you're seeing that the company has been experiencing some pain points and challenges in the last few years. Put yourself in the shoes of the employer. What could you do to help improve the condition of that issue if you were to be hired, right? So when you think about it that way, then you can start thinking about how you write the bullet points in your resume that are addressing the pain points of the employer. And at the same time, when you jump into the actual interview, you know what are some of the pain points are they're facing. You know that when you answer the questions, you're gonna answer the questions with ways that you, if you were to be hired, would add value to the company, it would address those issues. So that is a way for you to stand out versus the normal standard way of you applying for roles and also um, interviewing for those roles as well. Let's talk a little bit about, okay, so maybe I know how to stand out. Maybe I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. The job market, it's, it's challenging. How can I go about looking for platforms to help me? Some of the platforms that you can use today are LinkedIn, Indeed, and many other job search and, and job boards that are out there. I would also recommend for you to make sure you have a strong LinkedIn profile. I know this is a resume session, but I am a strong believer that LinkedIn, it's your online career portfolio. And so you want to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is as complete as possible and that it actually matches what's on your resume. I've seen a lot of times where your resume says one thing and your LinkedIn is completely empty or your LinkedIn is missing pieces. I would recommend that as you're working on your resume, you're also making sure your LinkedIn profile is at par and that it's concise and it actually matches what's on your resume. The other thing I would say is that I would recommend for you to be active. And that means networking, looking and seeking for opportunities, coming to events like this to learn, but also network with other people it's a great way for you to like find out what the opportunities are. One of the biggest challenges I've heard from people is I don't know what jobs are available out there. I don't see them. There's no jobs, right? And if you relate to that, let me tell you something. There are ways for you to actually go and, and, and network and try to find where the opportunities are. If you go to an event or a conference where a company is having recruiters there, a career fair, a virtual career fair, if you go to events like this, you will see that they are jobs available. Sometimes it's just, there's so many different companies. There's so many different things and it's hard for you to keep up with everything that's happening. So let's talk about solution for that. Some of the tools that I recommend with my eyes closed for people to keep themselves organized when it comes to editing the resume, editing the LinkedIn, basically their entire career portfolio, it's these ones that you see on the screen. Technology has impacted the world. And as such, we should follow that trend. There's many different AI tools nowadays that you can use to make sure your resume is up to date so you can organize your, your, your applications in like one job tracker without having to follow on your emails, et cetera. Some of these are tools like Teal, Ramp, ChatGPT, et cetera. One example of this one that I can give you is Teal. Teal, for example, have a job organizer or a job tracker where basically you can store all the job applications that you have and then you can update the status as you go. They also have extension, a Chrome extension where they would go on, on your application and it would automatically save it to their job tracker. And then they have a AI resume tool where you can basically upload your current resume upload a job that you want to apply for, and then the tool would match those two to tell you, here's some things you're missing. Here's the gap between the job and your resume. Here are some ways that you can rephrase these bullet points, et cetera. I'm going to teach you how you can do this on your own so then you know how you can use AI technology to help you with your resume, and then you can do the other part of reviewing and making sure that your resume is good to go. Because as I said at the beginning, we don't want to spend 10, 15, 20, 50 hours on this. At the same time, if you're saying, you know what, I'm okay. I, I don't want to use tools. I just want to do it on my own. Perfect. I'm also going to teach you how you can do it on your own. So this is going to be available for everybody. 
Your resume needs to tell your unique value proposition. I want I want to highlight this so much because people forget about to explain what is their unique value pro proposition. And a lot of you might be wondering, well, what is that value proposition? So value proposition is basically what you bring to the table, what you offer to the company, what do you offer to the employer? And so you can think about it this way. Well, the company is hiring for this role and I have some of the skills that they need or I have all of the skills that are needed, but then there's one more skill that I know is trending in my industry and it's not on the job description, but I know that can be used at, in this role specifically. So I'm going to make sure I highlight that on my resume and I'm going to make sure I speak about that on the interview. Why? Because think about it. If you have something that could literally help the company that they might not be needing, but you know you have it and you can offer it, that is your unique value proposition. It's what you bring differently that can add value to the company. And so when you think about it that way, it's more easy for you to identify what are some things that you bring that, that are different to what the standard things of things. As an example, let's say I'm a finance professional. As a finance professional, typically the standard skill set are Excel, PowerPoint, uh, project management, accounting, uh, your technical finance things, et cetera. And on the technical side, Excel might be kind of like the most technical that you'll, that you'll see in the sense of like platforms, right? We've been really good at Excel. But if you know SQL, if you know Python, which are programming languages, if you know Tableau for data visualization, if you know R, et cetera, you're one step ahead in terms of like your entire industry. So if you bring that to the table, like, hey, I am a finance professional, aside from all the normal standard skills that are needed, I also know how to take data and put it into Tableau, which is a data visualization tool. I also know how to do SQL to extract data. I also know how to code on Python. All of those things will be seen as a unique value proposition. So that's what I mean. Start thinking about what are some skill sets that you have that you know could add value to these roles, but that are not the standard across the board, right? So that's what I mean by a value proposition. So let's talk a little bit about formatting and structure. And as I said, if you guys have any questions as I go through this, please use the Q&A feature for your questions and we'll make sure at the end we'll answer them. So what are some best practices when it comes to formatting and structure? Let, let's, let's debrief a little bit about that. So. At the beginning, I share that, that that we should be very mindful about the formatting of our resumes. So something very important, very standard, make sure your resume is professional. It uses a clean layout, a structured formatting, uh, make sure you're not uh, using something that's not professional all over the place. Make sure it's easy for recruiters to read. I don't know if you've heard about the fact that recruiters sometimes take six to seven seconds to look at a resume. I'm not sure how true that is, but something I can tell you is that they will look at a resume pretty fast and be able to tell whether or not that person can be moved forward in the process. And so if that's the case, you want to make sure that as soon as the recruiter glimpses at your resume, they're like, this candidate is good, let's move it forward. So how do we make that happen? Having a professional looking clean out, having a professional um, structure, and then making sure your experience matches to what is on the job. Very standard, make sure your resume is in a chronological formatting, right? So from, from, from top to bottom, the most recent experiences to the older experiences. You also want to be mindful. If you have a lot of years of experience, you have 30 years of experience or something like that. You want to be mindful of only adding some of the most recent experiences. Because imagine if you have 30 plus years of experience, it's going to be difficult for you to include 30 years of experiences on a resume, right? So you just want to make sure that you include the experiences that are one, the most tailored to the job. So meaning the ones are actually relatable to the job. And then two, some of the most recent experiences instead of adding the full 30 years of experiences, right? So so, so make sure you, you have a little bit of like balance when it comes to that. Another thing is utilizing the white space on your resume, legible fonts, make sure you enhance readability, right? So a lot of the times we want to 
put our resumes with all the information in one page, for example, and then our resume is really hard to read. Do you want to make sure it's very balanced when it comes to having the white space versus the actual information? So yes, use the real estate, use the space on your resume, but don't overcrowd your resume where when it becomes hard for recruiters and hiring managers to understand and read through the resume. Um, they keep it to one page. It's very much optional at this point. If you're somebody who it's one to two years of experience into your career, then one page is kind of standard across the board. For somebody who it's five, 10, 15, 20 years of experience, I wouldn't put one, one page as, as a standard, right? Two pages, I've seen three pages. So don't feel obligated. I, I know you probably heard a lot about the one page. Don't feel obligated to just have one page, especially if you're someone who's more seasoned into their careers. But as you're looking into what you're including on your resume, also make sure you're concise and you're not having 10 pages long on your resume of, of, of experiences, which is, you know, 10 pages is just a lot. So having a balance between the two, it's, it's like the best way. And I will show you guys a clear visual of what your formatting should look like and should not look like when we go into the sample resumes at the end. And so with that, let me go into the next slide. So you want to make sure your resume is strategic. So what do I mean by strategic? Well, let's look at the, the sample resumes. For a student, you'll have education at the top, you'll have the skills, you'll have uh, their experience or internships, and then you'll have at the end, something else, interest, et cetera, personal projects. For more of a seasoned professional or early career professional, education should be at the bottom. Uh, you will have the contact information, you will have their skills, their experience, personal projects, and as I said, education at the bottom, and that is their resume. That is standard across the board. And so if your resume does not look like this, you might want to consider switching some things around. You want to make sure the most important things are at the top of your resume. So if you are a seasoned professional, your education from 10 years ago is not really relevant. It's not really as relevant to the job itself unless you're actually currently pursuing something, right? If you study and it's 10 years ago, make sure that is at the bottom of your resume. So those, that's what we mean about being strategic, making sure you position things as, as quickly for recruiters to, to catch and read as possible. As an example, for my own resume, I, I did a, a class at Harvard and MIT. At Harvard, it was about technology. And then at MIT, it was a data um, and machine learning and AI. It, this was during the 2020 pandemic. And what did I do? Well, that was one of the top things that I had on my resume at the time because those were really important certifications that I took for a year and they were live classes. And I wanted to show that even though I was a finance professional, I had experience when it came to, to actually technology. And, and I, I was up to date with some of the trends that were happening. So even if I was in my own industry, I still had certification skill sets that pertain to what's happening in the world. So that is my advice to all of you today. No matter what industry or role you're looking for, I would recommend for you to think about what is happening in my current industry and then what is happening in the world and how can I become up to like updated with that? How can I learn? How can I become master in that specific subject? Whether that is technology, whether that is social media, whatever the case may be, you want to make sure that you are there as the world progresses. You want to evolve with the involvement of everything else. You don't want to stay behind because what happens when you stay behind is gonna it's going to be hard for you to catch up with everybody else who is keeping themselves up to date with what's happening. How do you do that? I mentioned earlier, certifications, going through different boot camps, et cetera. So when it comes to having a strategic um, structure, and, and I think we talked about it earlier, it's like, I want to teach you guys how you can write bullet points and how you can make sure your resumes add a par so the employers want to hire you. Now, this is proven one of the most successful formulas when it comes to having successful resumes, and it's called the XYZ formula. Have you guys heard of this before? Let me know in the chat. You can just say yes or no. Have you heard of this formula before for bullet points on your resume? It's called the XYZ formula, and I just want to gather whether or not who people, okay, a lot of no's, which is great, so I can teach you guys something about it, okay? 
Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. So what is this XYZ formula? Basically, the XYZ formula is something that goes as follows. Accomplish X by doing Y resulting in Z. I want you guys, and I don't know if you guys have your resumes open as you're going through this 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 training right now, but I would definitely recommend that you have your resume open so that you can take a look at what's on your resume versus what we're going through right now as well. So if you look at your resume and your resume is not in this format, it might be hard for recruiters and hiring managers to understand what was the impact that you had in that experience. So for example, let's say you wrote 10 or you prepared 10 reports for senior management to analyze the trends of a new product and you wanted to showcase that on your resume. You should be thinking about, okay, why did I do that for? Who was the audience? And what was the result of me doing that? So if you wrote or prepared 10 reports for a new product to understand the trends that are happening in the market, and as a result, you are able to capture three things or three gaps that competitors to do not address and that your company could address with this new product, that's already giving a competitive advantage to your company. So now, how can you phrase this? Well, you can say, develop or prepare 10 reports using X, Y, and Z, meaning what do you use to prepare those reports? That could be a software, right? Like say Salesforce, right? Or PowerPoint, whatever the case may be, right? Use or develop 10 reports using PowerPoint or using a database to understand the current trends for a new product development that resulted in X, Y, and Z, resulted in reduction of production time by 10%, resulted in, um, I don't know, something like that, right? So you you, you can you can kind of tell where I'm going, where I'm coming from, right? You can kind of tell in where I'm going. You want to break it down like this way, all of your bullet points, right? What do you do? Where do you do it? What tool do you use? Who was the audience? And what was the result? Again, let's go back to the beginning. What do you do? Where do you do it? Who was it for? What's the result? Some of the major issues or, or problems that I've seen on resumes is that people either only list out their responsibilities or they only list out the result. So the result could be develop three reports for product development. Now, this is not wrong per se, but it's missing something because the question is, okay, but, but what were the, report, the reports for? Who was it for? What was the result? Like what happened? How did that benefit it, the company? So that those are the questions that you want to address as you're writing these bullet points. And why should you use this formula? Well, it sharpens your resume. It focuses on a metric oriented approach, which is what I recommend to everybody that I talk to. It's like, make sure you're showing the accomplishments and the impact on your actions. Another, I guess, me, me big misconception that I've seen on resumes, it's that people typically would copy and paste the, the job description into the resume. So like say you were doing this job for a long time and then you're just kind of like using the job description of that job you're working with as your resume bullet points. That is not what you want to do. You want to actually make sure you talk about what you did at the company. I will give you guys one a specific tip that I wish I knew when I was starting up my career and that I want everybody here to know. And it's about Brack Book. So what is a Brack Book? And I actually want to, I'm going to type it here in the chat. And I want to know if you guys know what a Brack Book is. If you know, please put yes or no in the chat. So you guys let me know if, if you know what a Brack Book is. Um, and then I'll, I'll see some people say yes. Some people say no. Okay. Let's see if what you guys know about Brack book is the same definition I have. So a Brack book is basically a repository, a list of all of the projects you've worked on in your entire life. It's not your resume. It's just a list of projects with all of the metrics accomplishments that you've done. An example of a Brack book could be project. I'm, I'm naming, okay. Project work. That is the name of the project. The project was about building X, Y, and C for um, three months. 
the users or the audience, it's X, Y, and Z. The people that you were working with were marketing, sales, et cetera. And then the results or the OKR, right? Or, or, or the main goal, the end goal of this project was to release for the broader audience and get X amount of sales, okay? That is one project in your brag book. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Why do you need a brag book? Because how many times haven't you looked at your resume and looked at a past experience and you're like, I don't know what I did here. I forgot what I worked there. I don't remember my metrics. I don't remember my accomplishments. I forgot about them, et cetera. I'm pretty sure a lot of you might have gone through those thoughts in the past. And so if you have a brag book that you update on a consistent basis, it's going to help you really, really a lot in your career. So I I actually think that your brag book should be updated more often than your resume because your resume can be updated pretty quickly. Um, you're updating here things here and there, right? But like your brag book should be updated consistently as you accomplish things that you wrap it up, you should also do it. You can do this on Excel. You can do this on, on a Word document, like whatever works best for you. But the point here is the best way to keep track of your accomplishments and what you can put on your resume is having a brag book. And so if you have, a, if you guys have any questions what a brag book should look like, use a Q&A feature and then we can go into that as well. So I wanted to really, really dive into the XYZ formula because the beauty or I, I like to call resumes more of an art than a science. And so the art of writing resumes is really about how you can write those experiences without actually leaving important points. So whenever I do, I, I used to do sessions with people and we would go over the resumes together. I would always ask these questions. Okay, I see this bullet point. What was this for? What was the result of this? Who do you work with? What skills do you use? Nine out of 10 times, they had skills that they use for that specific bullet point that were no listed on your resume, nowhere to be found. And in my mind, I was thinking, wow, like this is really something that could be the deal breaker to, to be chosen for an interview. But because you haven't, you know, you haven't really thought about this, this formula right here and like the accomplishment, you might have left out such an important part of your experience. So when you're going through your resume, whether later today or whenever you're going to be making edits to your resume again, I want you to read bullet by bullet and put your hat of a recruiter. So I'm a recruiter now. I put the hat of a recruiter, like say, hypothetically, and then I'm looking at my own resume. What are some things that I would ask myself if I wanted to hire this person, if I wanted to move this person to an interview? Okay, so you're going through your, your bullet points, you're going through your resume, and you're thinking, hmm maybe I wouldn't understand what it means here. Maybe this is too technical. Maybe this is too wordy. Maybe I need to add more here. Maybe I'm missing here. Maybe there's too much going on here. So that's what I want you guys to know. I want you to put on the mindset that if you were the recruiter looking at your own resume to hire you, would you do it? Would you hire yourself? And if there's any chance that the answer is no, then look into why. And then look into what are some things that you can fix from your resume and then look into how you can make those bullet points better. Okay. And I see some conversations in the chat and, and um, it, I, I see some questions also um, about uh, going questions in the chat. So if you guys have questions, please use the Q and A feature and drop the questions there. And then we'll make sure to answer them at the end as well. So, and if you guys are interested in learning more about how to write bullet points, how to write resumes in the right way. I recommend looking up this online, that go the XYZ formula, um, look this up online, see examples, and then make sure that your resume is aligned to that. So that's going to make a really big difference when it comes to, to your resume. So here's a visual. This is how you can actually apply this formula. So the XYC statements clarify your role and the direct impact that you have in your organization or your experiences. This is an example of how you can use it. 
increase customer retention by 15% by implementing a personalized follow-up strategy. Amazing. I would even include like for who, right? But but I'm seeing already like, okay, so there was a result happening here. I see what you did. Now maybe let's talk about how do you do it? And then let's talk about what platform do you use? So you're saying that you increase customer retention by implementing a personalized follow-up strategy. How do you go about um, that strategic follow-up? Do you actually look into past conversations with clients and then you started thinking about what were some, like, how do you do it? What was that process like, right? Think about process, result, process, result, right? As you're thinking about what to write on your resumes, that should be the way to go. Also perception, right? So the XOC formula, when you write in your resumes, it's, it, it, it helps you be, it become or show yourself as a proactive problem solver, right? Um, it helps employers view your potential. And I think that's something that people need to also understand, like, how do we make them see our potential? How do we make them see that we are actually valuable for this role? So I love talking. I love showing the, the ins and outs. I love showing how you can do it. But let's actually do it together, right? Let's Let's go through some resumes and let's look into what is working, what's not working, what do you guys think should change and what should not change. And as we're looking through these resumes, please have your resume open. Maybe you're seeing something on this resume that you're doing currently on your resume that you actually want to change, right? So I welcome you to have your resume open if you want to, but let's, let's look into this. I put together four sample resumes that I found online. These are just hypothetical, so none of this is real, but it's just for you to see like, what are these resumes and, and some of the most common used resumes online? So this is resume number one. Um, we're seeing here a picture. This is for a fictional character called Gert Rock, uh, regional manager for cryptocurrency, et cetera. Uh, it used to be a, a, a regional manager for Cheesecake Factory, et cetera. My question to all of you is, what is working and what's not working on this resume? We're gonna be using the chat a lot. So please use the chat to uh, you to drop your answers. Looking at this resume, you don't have to go really in depth into the bullet points, more so like the formatting. Um, what do you think it's working? What do you think it's not working here? Uh, we'd love to hear. And then I will share my own thoughts on this resume. So I'll give you guys 10 seconds to kind of share. Somebody said, what's not working is the formatting, okay. Um, so Paul, if you want to elaborate why the formatting is not working on the chat, feel free to do that. So somebody say this resume is not professional. Okay. As you guys share your own thoughts on that, you also are welcome to elaborate on like, what do you mean by that? Right? Like, why is this resume not professional? Why is the formatting not working? Um, somebody said not a specific details of accomplishments. Okay. I'm seeing that. Yes. That is, that's a great point. Anything else you guys see on this one? Been told formatting should be, okay. The name is, well, the name is here. Let me see who else. No chronological order of jobs. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm seeing great, great things here. A lot of you guys catch this, which is really important. Hit me up. What, right? That, that definitely should not be on this resume. So, Hopefully, nobody have ever used that. I've never seen that used before, but this should not definitely be on, on this resume. So let's dive deep into what I think it's working and not working on this resume. Here's some of the issues that I'm seeing with this resume. Adding a photo is not a common practice in the United States because it can create biases. So my recommendation is to not include a photo if you live in the United States. I also saw that there were lack of a specific quantifiable achievements. So if you look at the at the bullet points, there's absolutely zero numbers on this resume. There's no numbers, there's no metrics, there's no results. So it's hard to know like what was the real impact, right? Using buzzwords or cliches instead of illustrating with real life examples, right? So things like develop holistic solutions that are like, it may sound really great, but sometimes using a lot of like wordy sentences can be hard 
and can actually make it can actually make it uh, you can lose the point of the actual statement when you use too many words right so, and and wordy and buzzwords right i know that we've heard a lot about using keywords so that it can be catch so that right yes you can use strong words strong word action verbs etc just make sure your resume is understandable so something that I I, I think I, I found is the font choice. I mean, there was a consistent formatting. That's the one thing I would highlight uh, that that there was enough spacing in between so I could read. But this is not, this would be like, if I were to rank this resume, this would definitely be like kind of not on my top of, of my options here. So let's look into another example. See, this is resume number two. So what do you guys think is working and what's not working on this resume? Um, can be anything, formatting, coloring. Again, don't you don't guys don't have to look in too much into the bullet points. I know it's hard to read, but just like, let me know what you think is working and what's not working on this resume here. A lot of text, okay. Let's see, what do you guys think it's, it's working? What is what's working and what is not working here? I know we're focused a lot on like the the, the the working, the not working, but uh what, what do you guys think it's it's working here? I give you a couple of seconds. Okay, somebody said not visually pleasing. Qualifications at top seems good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit about this resume and 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 like what are some issues and things are working. The color overload can be a little bit unprofessional sometimes. Um, there's a lot of excessive coloring. I think there's a like gray with blue and red. I that's, that's kind of what I see here. So sometimes a lot of color can be a little can can go against the direction of what you want to achieve. I think this resume also lacks unity in terms of what I said, like in terms of what it's been used. Um and so something that it's working on this resume was the positive margins. I really, really like the way that the white spacing was used here. I feel like even though there's a lot of coloring, I felt like it was easy to read. Like as soon as I go here, boom, I see qualifications, experience, like it's easy for me to tell what's happening on this resume. Now, it's not like my top one choice, but in terms of like, formatting I think it could be better but I think like the actual use of white space was really good on on this resume I see some other chats coming in about education usually at the bottom that's true if you are not a student if you're a student then education should be at the top but if you're not a student please keep it at the bottom um somebody said let's see what else Experience should be said. Okay, so let's move into the next resume and see what you guys think. So this is resume number three. Wow, okay. This resume, what is working and what is not working? What do you guys think? Let me know in the chat. We see here work experience. We see skills, languages. Okay, what do you guys think is working and what's not working here? Very busy, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. There's a lot going on. Uh, somebody's mentioned the ATS, so we'll definitely address that. Yes, I will repeat that. So if you are a student, education should be at the top. Like if you're currently a student, education should be the top of your resume. If you're not a student, education should be at the bottom. That's a normal standard for resumes. I don't need all the social media channels. That is That is a good call out. The dark top and light bottom looks good. Okay. Good use of coloring. Somebody says it's easy to read, but probably doesn't give true details of projects. Okay. Let's look at a little bit about what, what's working and what's not working on this resume. So here are some issues that I found. I am personally not a fan of columns when it comes to resumes because of what somebody mentioned, which is the ATS. So let me ask this question. Do you guys know what an ATS is? And I'm going to type it here. Do you guys know what an ATS is? You can answer yes or no in the chat. Okay, no, no. Okay, see a lot of no's. So an ATS is the short for applicant tracking system. So an applicant tracking system, 
better known as ATS, is basically an uh, call it like a, a repository that recruiters use to manage applications for applicants. So when you submit an application online and you submit your resume, that resume goes through an applicant tracking system, an ATS that would scan through your resume, right? And would, would store your resume on their database or data files. And then it would include all your information and all of those things. So think about Workday, right? Sometimes when you apply for a job, you create an account and that account, you can see the job you applied to and the resume you submitted. Now, recruiters have like kind of like a behind the scenes of that. And that is called an ATS or an applicant tracking system. Now, what somebody mentioned earlier is that sometimes when you submit these type of resumes, the ATS might not read it correctly. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to get rejected because of this, right? What it means is that sometimes it's because an ATS is like an it's like a tool, it's like an AI tool, like it's reading, is scanning through your resume. So sometimes these type of formats might not be scanned through in the perfect way. So that's why I am not a fan of of call of two column resumes. Now, that's not to say that it's wrong, just that I'm particularly not a fan. Next thing, please, please, please do not rank your skills on your resume. You see here how this person has skills and they have like little like like rankings that goes from like one to five, I think. And then like the languages is also rank. I don't know where these actually originated from, but I would actually recommend against it because how do you prove these, these rankings, right? How do you prove that you're four out of five on customer and problem solving, right? Like it's really hard to prove and it gives no context about your skill sets, right? So you're actually doing a disservice to yourself because you're you're using space on your resume that you could use for other things that are more important and you're using a ranking that is just gonna work against you, right? So definitely recommend not, not rankings on your resume. Um, somebody mentioned all your social media channels, right? LinkedIn is sufficient when it comes to your resume. Now, what is working on this resume? Let's talk about good things. Highlight relevant experiences. So that this person feature internships that align with the field, right? So if this person is, is going for like an architect type of role, then this, this, this resume works great for that. I like the detail achievement, right? So specifying accomplishments and job duties. So like, um, Again, I think that this resume could be a, could do a better job in like highlighting their accomplishments in terms of like metrics. Like what were some of the results? Like this person said, created 3D models, et cetera, and video animation. Now the question, as I said earlier, like who do you do that for? How do you do that? Like, for example, if you created 3D models, I'm assuming it was on a platform, on a software. What's the name of the software, right? What was the result of that, right? So it, it's lacking a little bit of like the extra information. And I think that's something that we can we can look into. I did like the use of personal projects on, the, on this resume. And that's what I was mentioning earlier. If you're somebody who has a work gap, I think some, some of you guys earlier said that you're, you're worried about work gaps. If you're somebody who's trying to pivot into a new career, this is for you. Literally this right here. What are personal projects? Personal projects are basically projects that you work on your own time that would showcase to employers some of your top skills. As an example, I did a master class with uh, a bunch of people for 10 weeks. And the final project of that master class was developing a personal project that was aligned with the roles that they want to apply for. So we had consulting, we had finance, we have all those industries. Now for marketing specifically, there was a marketing group and the personal project that, that I had assigned to them was, I want you to review Walmart and Target social media account. And then I want you to identify what are some of their major engagements like how many comments are they getting? Are people really excited when they see their post, et cetera? And then I want you to create a PowerPoint, whatever you want to see a be better, a database, whatever, where you show some of the current challenges of Target and Walmart social media accounts and how you would improve that. What would some of your recommendations be if you were to work at Walmart or Target? They did that project and they included that, included that on your on their resumes and 
guys, this was literally one of their most asked questions on some of their interviews. Why? Because they might have not had the experience, but they were showing that one, they had different skill sets because they were leveraging some of the skills to prepare some of this. And two, they had information about like what's happening in their industry and they could showcase their, their skills and, and, and like, you know, how they they, they understand the job. They understand how to do the job. Right. And so for my work, for people that have work gaps here, for my career pivoters, everybody here, if you do not have a personal project section on your resume, but you're, you have not too much experience, a gap on your resume, et cetera, this is a great idea for you. If you have any questions on personal projects, use the Q&A feature and I will address them at the end. I think this is really important and I think this helped me a lot when I was starting off my career. So let's look at the last resume. Resume number four. Can you guys tell me in the chat what is working and what is not working here? Um, I see this person's product manager. I see a lot of things here. What is working and what is not working? I'll give you guys 10 seconds to, to drop it in the chat. Let me just check the chat here. What do you guys think this is good or bad? Okay, somebody says work for you, okay. You guys can can share why, what does it work for you? Uh, what do you like about it? Like, is there anything you like? Okay, so job title and date's easy to read. I agree. This one seems clean and well organized. I agree. In fact, guys, this was the format of my very first resume. So I really, really love this format. I really, really, really love that. Just the formatting, right? We we're talking about the formatting. Um, okay, easy to read, good for the ATS. Okay, so let's go into like what's working and what's not working about this resume. So the issues that I found on this resume was that it could be a lot of information and little to no space in between. So it might look a little harder to digest, right? Like just a lot of things, even though yes, it's important information, Sometimes a lot of information compact can be hard to read. So having a fine balance between like the white spacing might be good here. But I really, really like this resume. And there's a reason why I left it towards the end. Some of the top strengths that I found on this resume were um, metrics. So this person used metrics to define the resumes. For example, here, you can take a look into... Um, some of the things they like, let X, Y, and C project for a hundred plus users, blah, 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 generating a hundred million savings, da, 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 right? Like this person really use numbers and metrics all throughout the resumes. Definitely really strong use of action verbs, like develop, initiate it, perform, manage, et cetera. Really, really like that. Um, very important, selective achievements. This person highlighted their top two or three accomplishments for the role, basically like very informative and very like strategic. Like these are the things that I want to emphasize on this resume. Um, education at the bottom, love certifications as well there. Um, I think something that I would recommend here is, let me see. I think I'm missing something here. Yes. Something that you guys maybe didn't catch, but I catch was there's no skill section here, right? There's there's no skill section. So like as much as we are we're leveraging the, the, the experience section, you do want to have a skill section, especially if this person is working in a lot of technical things, you might want to have a section where you show all of those softwares and platforms that you've used, especially if you're not leveraging those over your bullet points on your experiences. So that's the one thing I would say, aside from like the, the lack of space in between, I would add a skill section on this resume and then this resume will be good to go for me. This is the resume that I would go for if I was applying for a role in this specific industry, of course, making some tweaks here and there. So, that is four different resumes. You guys can literally look at your resumes and see which one do you currently have and which one are like what are some things that you can change and leverage for, for your own resume. So to wrap things up, here are some principles that I live by when it comes to resumes. Number one, simplicity, uniformity, 
a target resume and a results oriented resume. So simplicity when it comes to like clear headings, concise language, making sure it's everything is concise, uniformity, right? Having consistent formatting all throughout your resume, targeted, right? Meaning targeted your content on your resume aligned with the job description. And then last but not least, results oriented. So highlighting achievements and measurable outcomes that really, really show your value as a, can as a candidate and to employers. Your resume will not land you a job, but it will land you an interview, which is a step closer to the job. And so making sure that you have a really strong resume for your next applications is key. So make sure you guys take a look at your resumes today, take some of these um, tangible steps and change how your resume currently looks. So this is it for my presentation today. We'll have a couple of minutes now to address all of your questions. You also can find me on all social media as Stephanie Nuesi. Um, if you guys want to follow my content or uh, see some other content strategies and tips that I share, all things job search, professional development, you can find me there as well. But yeah, I, I think I'll hand it over to you, Alec, for the Q&A portion. Thank you very much for that presentation. I was listening to when you were talking about the brag book and I said, ooh, that's one of those things. Because 10 years later, I'm like, wait a second. I know I had that. I know I did a lot of fun stuff at that job and I have to go through all my files and everything. If I only had kept a brag book, maybe like once a week updated or once a month updated, I would have been like, there it is. Those mm -hmm. are the things I did. That's very good advice to have that and it doesn't feel like in the moment that you want to do it it's like oh i'll remember but no you know 10 years pass and you don't remember hardly anything i agree and and as i said earlier like i wish i knew about what a brag book was when i was first out in my career and so i, I think you've heard that often of people saying well but i don't know what i did there or i don't know what what my impact was but then if you had that you can just quickly go back to it it's easier for you to just do a quick edit on your resume mm -hmm. absolutely so let's get into some of the questions here. So the first question is, what are some good ways to find and understand an employer's pain points? Great question. Um, so I think a lot of the times when it comes to like this type of things, what you can do is read the news. So some like, um, Peter, let me just question here. Yeah. Some of the things that I would do if I was looking for a job right now, it's looking into Wolf, um, newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, Morning Brew, and kind of reading like on a consistent basis. How is the industry performing? Uh, looking into your company's like reports. So for example, I am a fan of looking into a company's 10K and 10Q report, but I'm in finance. But again, even if you're not in finance, like just seeing how the company is performing, you can see oh, well, this company is not doing as well. Maybe, you know, their last product, they not perform as well, right? Um, let's give an example, like, um, let's say Walmart or Target, they, you know, they, they maybe they have declining sales. Why is that? Why is that happening, right? And if you were to be hired for like a sales development or a product development position or a consultant, how would you address that from your position? So those are things that you want to look into. What are some things that a company is currently having challenges? So not just the company, but the industry. When you think about just your company, Think about the industry because whatever happens in the industry might affect across the board most of the companies, right? So if you know what's going on in the, in the industry, then you can look into like pain points and challenges and then align that with your resume. That makes sense. In the same in the same vein to look at emerging trends because they mm -hmm. might be on there. That's, that's a great point. So uh, do we need an address on a resume any longer or just an email? Do we need to have a cell phone number? Great question. I recommend only your city. I recommend only your city. So if you live in, um, I don't know, New York, I would put New York and then your email. I, I, I go against putting your whole address on your resume just for privacy issues. Um, but yes, I would recommend your city, your email, and then your LinkedIn profile link into your resume. And then I think the other question was about the phone number. Yes, you can include your phone number as well. So it will be phone number, city, email, and then your LinkedIn. So just what they need to con the basics to contact you because they're not going to send you a snail mail letter. Exactly. All right. What if past work experience was in government or high security role and you cannot share the details of who, what, when, etc.? That is a great question, and I've got I've gotten that a lot. Um, I think some of the ways that you can go about that is that you don't have to include the actual fact, but you can like for I give you an example. If you work in finance, 
most often than not, you cannot share the actual number. So if you manage like a like a one billion dollar budget or whatever the case may be, you're not gonna be able to share that. But you can share manage at sign dollar xx million right budget for whatever department. And if you cannot include the department, just say you manage a specific budget for a department. That result. I think the major important thing is like the result, right? So even if you cannot share like who do you work with or the actual number, what was the result? Did it help save time for your team? Did it help um, with the product development? What did it help with? I think that's like the most important factor here. So you can, and, and there's ways online that you can research like how to, I don't know if it, if it, the word is like anim, an, anonymize the, mm. the, the actual like bullet points so that you can still include it without actually revealing any confidential information. So it's like generalize while sitting, still including the kind of operative results. Exactly. So here's a question. Uh, as an actor, how do I stand out on my resume other than my acting experience and stuff like that? That is a great question. I would actually say it depends on what role you're looking for. So I would actually like bring this question back to the person who asked it. If you can include in the Q&A what role you're looking for, then I can tell you because the thing is like, Acting has a lot of transferable skills. And so I think I'll, I can just give you a general, um, a general response. So basically any job, including acting, have a lot of transferable skills. So depending on what you're going to apply for, you can highlight those transferable skills. If you're going, if you want to apply for like a, a production company, an entertainment company, uh, an acting company, and, and it's still within that range, then I would highlight your top accomplishments as an actor, right? But if you're looking into like transitioning into another career from an acting career, then I would look into, well, number one, what are some of the top skills in that position that I want to apply for. And if I don't have those skills, I would one, try to learn the skills by taking certifications, et cetera. But I would also include what are some of the transferable skills like project management, problem solving, and those type of things. And I would highlight that on your resume. And when I read that question, I, I was thinking, how do they differentiate themselves within the entertainment among other actors? And that's a tough one. That's, you know, because that's, that has to do with your, with your look, your headshot, you know, in addition to your special skills and, and acting experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm happy to like, you know, go more in depth into this question with that person. Feel free to reach out to me if you, if you want more, more context into that. Thank you. And so the next question is, and you mentioned LinkedIn a few times and mentioned having the link, link to your LinkedIn profile and account. Um, so this question is, how much of the resume really needs to be on LinkedIn word for word? Should there be more on LinkedIn with a link to your LinkedIn profile on your resume? That's a great question. Um, so LinkedIn has a experience section where I would recommend you include your experiences with the bullet points that's on your resume. At the end of the day, your resume will mostly be your experiences, whereas your LinkedIn will be your experiences, your headline, you'll have a banner, you'll have a project section, you'll have a volunteering section. There will be a lot of different options on LinkedIn that might not be on your resume. So your LinkedIn might actually, in fact, have more things than what's on your resume. My recommendation is do not leave out anything important on LinkedIn that you have on your resume. So if your resume is three important bullet points of your top three accomplishments, you will want to make sure that that's included on your work experience on your LinkedIn profile. So that's that's basically what I mean is matching your top things on your resume with what's on your LinkedIn profile. The next question is, what if you left a job, didn't have a brag book, and don't remember the stats or analytics that went along with that job? That's a great question. And it's hard to answer because um, at, at, as you can know, right, like you better than anybody else would know, like what are some of the things you did at that job? If you don't have a rack book, you would have to do some reflection and sit down and, and think back at you, like, what do you actually do on a day to day? Uh, you don't have to think about specific numbers, but at least think about like, generally, what do you do on a day to day? Is there anything that stands out from what you did in the past that you want to emphasize? Like, oh, I remember this one time. Um, I helped create this big report that was like shared with like EPs or the directors or or I solved this really big problem that would have caused data issues or would have caused like a lot of things with our customers and I fixed that, right? So that's, that's what I mean, like looking in depth into like, what do you do in a day-to-day, -day, but then also like, what is something that you remember that resonates with you about what you did? 
we are humans, so it, it's okay if we don't remember everything we did. And if we don't have a black book, then today is a good day for all of you to start having one. But if you don't have one, then I would recommend just thinking back into day to day and then two or three big things that you really remember that you are proud of that you did at that job. Do you think, Stephanie, that it would be hel it's helpful to uh, generalize or at one point does it stop being helpful to say, you know, I did, you know, increased sales. I mean, would it be helpful to just say increased sales? if you don't have a number attached to it? I think if you don't have a number, you might want to focus on the actual like result as, as a result of that, like what happened. Mm -hmm. So if you increase sales, does that mean that it helped like hit your quota or does that mean that it helped the 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 company like generate more revenue even if you don't have the number the, the actual number of the revenue does it mean that you got recognized for that does it mean that your team was recognized for that like what does that mean impact on a more general level for the company and your team it doesn't just have to be about like your specific impact if you don't know the numbers and think about like how did that impact the company and, and your team in the role mm -hmm. see there's a thing about for instance how would i jazz this up if i don't have numbers process sales orders to generate bills or credits to customers reconciled shipping records with sales orders and accounts it's a pretty Let difficult pretty pretty on the spot here i know it's for instance how would i just this up if i don't have numbers process sales orders to generate bills or credits to customers reconcile shipping records with sales orders and account so you process sales orders to generate bills or credits so the question is how do you process those orders do you use a software for that that's the first question and then you reconcile shipping records with sales orders and account how did that help does that did that help li like lit it like I, I guess the word would be like did that help decrease the risk or potential risk of like discrepancies between shipping orders and accounts like how did that help overall with the job that you were doing the people you were serving the team or the company so that's how i would like flip this saying so yeah you process those orders to generate i would actually say process 10 percent of the total sales orders or process sales to generate x y and c using this platform you know, resulting in X, Y, and C. So it, I, I think what, what works here, like it's like the X, Y, C formula, like going back to that, it's like, I feel like I read this more of like as a paragraph versus a bullet point. So if you, if you flick the formatting and then you address how did it help the targeted audience, it's going to help you a lot. The last thing I would say, and I shared earlier, and I can go back to that slide, is these resume tools work really well and handy when it comes to this thing. So like, Teal and Ramp specifically are two that I recommend. If you copy these into their tools, you copy your resume if you already have that and you copy the job, it will help you generate some drafts of things that you can say and then you edit it on your own, right? So you don't have to like think and overthink and overthink about like this type of thing. So hopefully that has, that's helpful. And I'll put a link to those in the follow-up email. So it sounds like what you're saying when it comes to rewording a resume where you don't have all the information is to focus on impact, you know, the impact that you had for the target audience. Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, it's like, it's, it's those questions of like, who do you help? Right. So targeted audience and like, what was, what, what, what was that help? What, what was that? Right. So if you think about the impact, who did that help? Whether it's users, so your customers, was it internally like other teams? Was it your specific team? Like maybe you improve a process within your team that actually helped them like save time and oper uh, like their operations improve as a result of that. That's what I mean, impact, focus on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what if you left a job? Did Oh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the same question. <laughs> um, did you include, uh, do you include the year you graduated? That's a question we get often for resume programs. Yes. And, and I think it, I think it just really depends on how far out you are in your career. Right. So like people need to also, I think, um, realize that education matters when you're in school or when you're one or two years out of your career. After that, like companies will be looking or, or recruiters will be looking into your actual experience. Right. And so I feel like you should focus on like your experience and like after a couple of years into your career, the year you graduate doesn't really matter. I mean, I've seen plenty of people do not even use the year they graduated on LinkedIn, right? They don't use it on their resume. So if you have five years of experience, 
just having what like your graduation like the actual title should be sufficient and if they i mean if the company needs a graduation day they will ask it on the application form or the recruiter will actually ask you so it's not going to hurt you that you don't have your graduation date on your resume if you're somebody who's more seasoned in their careers yeah, I was just thinking about that. I was just, I was like, do, do I have it on mine? I'm, I mean, I'm more, I'm a decade out from graduating. I don't have my the year on mine anymore mm -hmm. because I figured I have the degree. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter when I graduated. Exactly. All right. So let's see. Uh, I don't know if you, you, you'll be able to answer this one if you have experience with this piece of software, this platform. Do you think services like resume worded work? It, it is hard to tell if it works after using the tool to adjust my resume to match a job description because I get automatic rejections. Yes, let me take a look at the question again. Think services like... so resume worded. It is hard to tell if it works after using the tool to adjust my resume to match a resume because I get them. Yeah, so unfortunately, None of these tools um are perfect and none of them will like guarantee you a job. I think like that's why I always say like I don't have experience with this tool you mentioned, but I would say like just with any tool in general, like use the tool to like give you directions as to where you would need to go when it comes to like matching it to your job description. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be like how you show yourself like on your resume. And also I want to clarify and make sure you guys know that there's so many other applicants and it, you know, it sometimes it's not you. And I know you probably heard this a lot, but like, it's, it's true. Sometimes it's not you that like, there might be somebody else who have one thing about that specific job that they need that you don't have. And I think at the end of the day, if you know that you did your best on your resume, that your resume is matched with the job description that you use, the tools that you could use, even if you got the rejection, it's okay, right? Like, like you did what you could. You did the best you could. Let's move forward with the next one. And I know it sounds a little bit like too general, but it's it's the it's the true, right? Like it's it, you don't control what happens after you submit that application. So what do you control? This right here. So as long as you do what you can to make sure your resume is at a par and it like you know you're a good candidate and that is shown on the resume, that's all you can control. That's a sphere of influence. If you you can't control what's on the other side. Okay. Although I gotta say, if your resume isn't getting any hits, I mean, if you're putting in a ton of resumes and none of them are getting interviews, then whatever software you're using might not be might not it might not be working. Yeah, but also I wouldn't rely like solely mm -hmm. on software too. Yeah. Like I would like actually that's why I get love this this type of workshops. Come, I, I want to teach you how to do it. So that you only see these tools as like, as, as I said, as a gap, like, you know, to that's a path towards and you're the one who actually is going to go and like making those edits. So it can just boost it a little bit. Exactly. All right. So let's see here. Uh, should you ever include an interest section to show you're a well-rounded person with interests outside of your industry, like charities you work with, et cetera? That's a great point. Um, so I mentioned the objective at the beginning and I said that it was optional and it just depends on your situation. So if you're like a well-seasoned professional and you're trying to change careers and that might not be shown on your on your experiences, then an objective might be um an option for you. Now, if there's things like charities that you that you kind of work with, you could include a section on your resume called volunteering. Um so a lot of people have this like volunteering or uh, leadership involvement or something like that, where you can include some of this work that you're doing with these charities and, and et cetera. So that could be a way that you can address that without having to have it on, on an intro on your resume. So the objective, I would only use it to kind of like amplify like your experience and like how you add value to, to any company. And then if you have a specific things like, like charities or leadership involvement that you have, you might want to have it as a leadership involvement on, an, on its own section on your resume. Thank you. Um, how do you go about explaining career gaps? Great question. So first things first, and it's important for you to know, like you don't owe like people an explanation as to the career gap in terms of like, I feel people feel very pressured to tell their entire life history when they're asked, like, why do you have a career gap? I think you can just kind of focus on explaining does it like whatever student? Oh, I took a career gap to advance on a different skill set or to identify the next move in my career. And in that time, I actually took XYZ certification or I actually uh, got involved in X, Y, and Z. And that's it. Literally, like I, I know that it sounds simple, but you don't have to go too in depth into like your personal reasons as to why you took a career gap. I think you should focus into like, 
the focus of the career gap and what do you do during that time to make sure you you like because at the end of the day, employers are worried that you're not um up to date. And remember I was saying it that earlier, like like you're not up to date with like the market trends, like what's happening, like the top on demand skills. So like as soon as you can show employers that you actually are up to date with the skills and what they're looking for in a candidate, then that should be part of your answer when you're addressing a career gap. It's like you're put yourself in their shoes and make them feel comfortable enough that you have what it takes and what they're looking for regardless of that career gap. And if that means that there there were five different tools that were developed during those, those year gaps that you had, make sure that you either took a certification or show somewhere on your resume and a personal project, for example, that you actually learned that, that skill and that you can put it into practice at the job. At the end of the day, right? Like I think about like personal projects, a lot of people that have career gaps actually focus on adding personal projects on their resume so they can showcase, hey, you know, I, I have not worked in the workforce for three or five years, but it, like regardless of that, I work on like several different projects and you here's my portfolio, whether it's like GitHub, if you're like a technical person or like a drive link, whatever the case may be, and you kind of show them like I've actually... I've actually did a project for your company. You know, like, this is interesting. I had um, I had a person who like had a career gap, but they were interviewing with this company. And um, well, first of all, in the resumes, they included personal projects, right? So like to to kind of like not make up, but like adding a little bit of value into like you know they didn't have that much experience, but they have some person some projects. They got an interview, and in that interview, they actually did a personal project for the company. Um, a couple of years back, it was got, actually just happened. And so on that interview, they addressed the fact that, oh, I did a personal project for this company a couple of years ago. I um, I saw that you guys had struggled with X, Y, and Z. And as, as a result, I wanted to see, like, these are some things that I would do if I were to be hired at this company. Um, just, just kind of looking at those challenges that it faced. So again, like pain points, challenges, et cetera, like it all comes together here. So long story short, it's basically focusing on like, how do you ensure the employer that you can still do the job, even though you have the career gap? That should be the main thing here. Thank you. We have time for just about one more question. And it's another one that focuses a little bit on, well, potentially on career gaps. What are your thoughts on the functional resume format as opposed to chronological? I've heard suggestions that a work gap would be better represented using a functional format, but it seems not everyone agrees. Interesting. I wonder what a functional resume format is. I actually have to look mm -hmm. that up because I don't have the visual here. So um, it's like uh, instead of listing your experience by uh, like chronologically, you list it based on the specific specific job skills. I see. Um, I mean, I would see it working in the sense of like, uh, like, like visually speaking, but the employer will still know though that that you had a career gap because I would assume you'd include the dates, right? Um, and so if that's the case, then what I would focus on it's like I, I, my preferable resume format is still chronological. Um, and if you have a career gap, I would address a career gap with other methods like the personal projects, et cetera, and certifications you've taken. I don't think the format of the resume is going to address the career gap itself, if that makes sense. So I think I would, for, I would, I would focus on actually addressing the issue, which is how can you ensure employers that you, you're actually been doing things to keep yourself up to date or that you've actually have the skills that they need. And that should be like the major thing that I would focus on. So I mean, again, my personal opinion, you, you guys can can literally like use whatever format works best for you, right? See if a functional format works for you and you get an interview, then that's great. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, you should just really focus on like addressing the main issue, which is a career gap. We're going to do one more question because I think this one is important to address. Um, does Stephanie offer personal services to evaluate and improve a resume? That's a great question. So um, you can go on my LinkedIn and look at all of the, the the services that I offer. I personally like and value to provide free content on 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 LinkedIn about these things. And so if you go on my on my profile on LinkedIn, you'll see all of the tips that I share. Whatever I share here, I share over there on a daily basis. Um, and also there's a lot of templates and resources that that I share. So you can take a look there. 
Um, and so, so yeah, I, I'll invite you to go into my profile and, and, and check out what, what I, what I offer there, but I would recommend for you to actually, um, take a look at some of the free content that's are out there and, and, and try to look into that. And then hopefully with what I shared today, you're, you're kind of able to, to do it on your own because that's, that's my main goal. You know, a couple of years ago when I was working on reviewing resumes, I actually made the realization that I wanted people to learn how to do it so they could do it on their own. So that way they can get a skill and practice of like doing it over and over and over. So whenever they have to update their resumes, they could do it on their own. And so that's why I went in depth into the XYZ formula because I hope that after today, you guys had the opportunity to to go edit your resumes and, and, and make a great one. I know everybody here, and I'm hoping everybody will get higher into their next roles. Um, so, so yeah. Stephanie, thank you very much for this outstanding presentation. And for the folks out there, thank you for being here. I do have one request. I have a post event survey that I'm going to post in the chat right now. And it should come up when we close the Zoom as well. So if you're not able to click the link now, you'll still be able to get it later. It's a very short survey. Just let us know what you how you felt about the program. If there are any topics you'd like us to cover, we really read those responses and they there would shape making work ready relevant to you. So thank you to all the folks out there. Thanks again to Stephanie for the presentation and we will see you next time.